we're going to look at a really nice problem from a Lithuanian exam that uses a really nice trick. I think it's like one of my favorite tricks for solving a problem that, well, it seems unrelated to the trick that we're going to use. So anyway, let's look at what we have. Our goal is to find the smallest natural number n so that an n by n square can be partitioned into two types of smaller squares. One that's 40 by 40, that's one type, and then the other type is 49 by 49. So just to visualize what's going on here, let's suppose this big yellow square is our n by n square. So being partitioned by these two types of squares means that we can just break it down into pieces where perhaps this upper left bit is a 40 by 40 square, right next to it is a 49 by 49 square, and so on and so forth. And I'd like to point out, just so that it's not trivial, we take the rule that we must use at least one of each of these types of squares. Okay, so let's get to it, and I'd like to point out that the solution is based off an art of problem solving thread um, focused around this problem. Okay, so what I'm going to start by doing is sketching out something that which will be our n by n square. So obviously we can't draw an n by n square because n is an arbitrary natural number that we're solving for at this moment, but you know we can get an idea of what's going on just by looking at a mock-up. Okay, so let's say we've got our n by n square, so it's broken up like this. I'll do the first few rows and the first few columns as well. And then perhaps I'll also need a last row and a last column just so that I've got that there as well. So let's get that into this situation. Okay, so there we've got it. There's our n by n square with enough pieces that we can fill in, uh, you know, to get an idea of what's going on here. And now what we're going to do is take two primitive roots of unity. And so those are complex numbers satisfying, well, z to the m, if you will, minus 1 equals 0. So that would be an nth root of unity, and a primitive nth root of unity will be 1 so that if you raise it to any power less than m, you do not get 1. I think I said 0 before, but I meant 1. Okay. So anyway, let's set alpha equal to e to the i times 2 pi over 40. So that's going to be a primitive 40th root of unity, meaning that alpha to the 40th is 1, but alpha, alpha squared up to alpha to the 39, those numbers are all equal to, well, not equal to 1. That's the important part. And then we'll set beta equal to a primitive 49th root of unity. So that's e to the 2 pi over 49. And maybe before we really dive into it, I'd like to point out that just by some factorization, it's well known that primitive 40th and 49th roots of unity satisfying, satisfy these following equations. And that's 1 plus alpha, plus alpha squared, all the way up to alpha to the 39 is in fact equal to zero. You can see that by factoring alpha to the 40 minus one into alpha minus one, or and then the rest of it. And we know that alpha minus one is not zero. Okay, so anyway, then we also know that one plus beta plus beta squared, all the way up to beta to the 48 is equal to 0. So those are going to be important. And now what we'll do is place complex numbers built out of this alpha and this beta into the square. So I'm going to say this is 1, and then here we're going to put the number alpha, here will be the number alpha squared, alpha cubed, all the way over here this will be alpha to the n minus 1. Because this is an n by n square, so that means here we have like alpha to the 0 to alpha to the n minus 1, if you will. Okay, great. And then down here we'll take beta, beta squared. The next one will be beta cubed all the way down here, beta to the n minus 1. And then we fill it in from there. So this is going to be alpha, beta, 
alpha beta squared all the way down here will be alpha beta to the n minus one. This is alpha squared beta all the way down here to alpha squared beta to the n minus one. Over here is alpha to the n minus one beta and then way over here is alpha beta both raised to the n minus one. And then obviously there are some other boxes that we could fill in. And now I'm gonna make the following claim and that claim is that if we sum all of the squares or all of the markers of the squares here, we get zero. So the sum of the markers equals zero. But notice that that's the same thing as saying that the sum as maybe i and j go from one to n of alpha to the i, beta to the j is equal to zero because that's exactly what the sum of the markers is. Oh, and I guess I should scale this a little bit or re-index that's from zero to n minus one just based off of how we have seen this. So, well, what's the proof of that? Well, the proof is to look at a subsquare. So let's do that. Well, look at each type of subsquare. Subsquare, obviously that's building the entire square. So let's maybe put the subsquare in green or no, maybe we'll use the same color that we did over here. Okay, so we've got a sub square here and maybe this is a 40 by 40 sub square. And then, uh, you know, through symmetric arguments, the 49 by 49 sub square will kind of work the same way. So I'd like to point out that this will start somewhere like alpha to the X and then uh, beta to the Y just based on the upper left location of this subsquare in as it partitions the whole square. And then as we go across here, we'll have alpha to the X plus one, beta to the Y, all the way over here, alpha to the X plus 39, beta to the Y. And I stopped at 39 because like I said before, for this case, or for just illustration, we're working with the 40 by 40 square. And then, well, the next row will be fairly similar. We'll have alpha to the X, beta to the Y plus one, alpha to the X plus one, beta to the Y plus one, all the way up to alpha to the X plus 39, and then beta to the Y plus one. And then similar things are gonna happen down all of the rows. But we'll just look at what's happening if we sum the first row because it's a good illustration for what happens if we sum any of the rows. So let's take the sum of this first row, you know, factor out a greatest common factor, and we see that we have alpha to the x, beta to the y, and then what's left over is one plus alpha all the way up to alpha to the 39. But since we've got a 40th root of unity, we know that that sum one up to alpha to the 39 is in fact equal to zero. But that's summing the first row. Observe that summing the second row will be essentially the same thing. We just factor out uh, beta to the y plus one. And in fact, uh, summing any of those rows will be similar. We just factor out a beta to the y plus something. So that means that the sum of all the 40 by 40 squares is equal to zero, or the sum of all of the markers in the 40 by 40 squares is zero. But really similarly, just summing columns instead of rows, the sum of the markers in the 49 by 49 squares are also equal to zero. But if all of the subsquares sum their markers equal to zero, then that means the sum of the entire square is also equal to zero, given the fact that this entire square is being partitioned by those subsquares. So that finishes the proof of our claim here. So now that we've got that proven, let's see where we can go from there. So we just finished arguing that if we sum all of the markers that we see in our n by n square, we get zero. So what we're gonna do from here is sum the markers a different way and use the fact that we know that's equal to zero by the claim to make our next argument. And what we'll do is we'll sum all of the columns first. And after we sum all of the columns, we'll sum across what's left over and that'll be the sum of everything. Okay, 
So observe here that we've got, what is it? It's a finite geometric series, one plus beta up to beta to the n minus one. That has a well-known sum of beta to the n minus one over beta minus one. So let's move that over, beta to the n minus one over beta minus one. Okay, but then observe that what we have in this next column is pretty much exactly the same, except it's attached to an alpha. So here we've got alpha times beta to the n minus one over beta minus one. And then the next one will be alpha squared times the same thing. All the way up over here will be alpha to the n minus one times the same thing. Because what we have here is really just the same geometric series, you know, multiplied by a different constant in each column. Okay, but now what we'll do is sum what's left over and that'll be the sum of everything. But now we've got a greatest common factor that we can pull out and observe that after that, what do we have? We've got a, another finite geometric series, but now alpha is the common ratio. So putting that all together, we have alpha to the n minus one times beta to the n minus one over alpha minus one times beta minus one. But notice that we know that's equal to zero by our claim. But what does that tell us? That tells us that alpha to the n minus one equals zero or beta to the n minus one equals zero. But then since alpha is a primitive 40th root of unity and beta is a primitive 49th root of unity, this first one would imply that uh, n, sorry, that 40 divides n. In other words, n is a multiple of 40. And then this next one would imply that 49 divides n. In other words, n is a multiple of 49. But now let's also make another observation, and that is the following, that alpha must be of the following form, 40 times a plus 49 times b where A and B are natural numbers. Well, and why is that? Well, that's because we can just count the number of boxes in this top row. Notice that we're partitioning it with 40 by 40 and 49 by 49 squares. So, well, those squares will end at the top or certain squares will end at the top. And if we count across, we're counting in chunks of 40 and 49 a chunks of 40 and B chunks of 49, if you will. Okay, so now what we'll do from here is take this fact right here about the divisibility of N, and then this fact right here about the shape of, that should be an N right there, and well, really take it to the end. Okay, so we just finished arguing that N had to be of the form 40A plus 49B, and 40 divided in or 49 must divide in. But let's notice if 40 divides in, well, we see that 40 divides 40 times A, so that means that 40 also has to divide 49 times B. But since 40 and 49 are relatively prime, that means that 40 must divide B. In other words, B is a multiple of 40. So here we have B, is a multiple of 40 or 40 divides B. So now what we're looking for is the smallest number of this form where B is a multiple of 40. Well, that's gonna be, if we take B equal to 40 and A equal to one. So let's say smallest is N equals 40 plus 49 times 40 but that's kind of clearly equal to 50 times 40 or 2,000. Okay, so now let's look at this next case. So kind of in parallel to the first case, if 49 divides n, we know that 49 must divide a, which means the smallest in this case is n equals 40 times 49 plus 49 but we can pretty quickly see that that's equal to 2006. Oh, sorry, that should be 2009. Okay, well, what do we see? Well, the smallest in this case, 
was 2000, the smallest in this case was 2009. That means it looks like the smallest possible is 2000. Well, but that's not the final part of our solution. That just says that uh, based off of the arguments that we've made so far, the smallest possible type of square is a square that's 2000 by 2000. Now we have to exhibit such a square. So you could pause the video right now and see if you can draw such a square, a 2000 by 2000 square that's broken into these types of subsquares. But I'm just going to get one on the board right now so we can check it out. Okay, so here's a picture that I came up with of a 2000 by 2000 square being partitioned by these 40 by 40 and 49 by 49. So I've color coded it so that the green squares are 40 by 40. And the idea is to make this L shape that has 50 40 by 40 squares on the maybe left hand column and then 50 40 by 40 squares on the top row. And that gives us this big chunk down here to work with, but that perfectly fits something that's built out of 40, 49 by 49 squares. So we've got 40 going up and down here, up and down here, and then across at the top and across at the bottom as well. And well, just by simple counting, that's fairly clearly a 2000 by 2000 square, which we showed was the smallest possible. And that's a good place to stop.